Hello and welcome to the Movie Moolah podcast. I'm your host, Ben Yenny, and with me today is executive producer Sean Patrick Burke. Sean, why don't you uh, tell our listeners a little bit more about what you do as an EP? Yeah, well, also produce. <clears throat> producing, and producer. Uh, yeah, producing is definitely my uh, my 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 forte. Um, mm-hmm. For me, uh, I got into this industry uh, working with logistics and working as a first AD and um, mm-hmm. just understanding the set dynamics and everything that happened and how, you know, productions were put together, you know, hiring the crews and managing crews and, and the infrastructure that keeps things going. I decided to jump into producing. And, um, and so from there, I think I have a really good head on my shoulders when it comes to, you know, how a crew and their cast are, are to be treated when it comes mm-hmm. to producing. That was a big reason for me. I feel like there's always a separation between the producers and the rest of the world in, mm-hmm. uh, on the film set. So that was a huge, uh, huge reason why I jumped into producing. Um, and then the first film that I, I, I was a lead producer on, we took to uh, the Sundance, um, and that was As You Are. And uh, that was a great experience. But um, yeah, and then I, I have executive produced in the past as well. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, as a really, it's, it's, it's a situation of going and putting equity together for, for productions. And uh, that's a, that's something big that I do as well for my own productions um, to raise money for them. So, yeah. yeah, that I think that's the part of the process that most filmmakers find most frustrating um, and most hard to grasp, I suppose. Um, at least in part because, at least in my experience, there's not really a single playbook for it. It's more of a... Uh, set of tools and figuring out how to use each one when when to use each one um but before we get a little bit more into that um a lot of people don't really understand the difference between a producer and executive producer uh specifically that at least in my experience and how i use the term executive producer is a lower title than producer is that how you found it as well or i think that in terms of i mean there's definitely a def- definitely a difference between film and tv you know mm-hmm. in TV, uh executive producers are that's that's the the top of the food chain mm-hmm. in terms of the films and you know feature films it is going to be the um the producers that are at that top level uh but i don't know if it's really a difference between it's just hard because you have to lump a lot of executive producers together, uh, whether they help bring financing to a film, because you really can't, you know, it's illegal for you to have, uh, you know, finders on your production. So mm-hmm. you executive producer credits um, or the actual financiers. Mm-hmm. So it's it's hard to really differentiate between those, you know, and that's something that you'll see a lot of independent films have a lot of executive producers because it took a lot of people to put those productions together and, a lot of different money pots going to to and from, so that is is very different difficult to differentiate between. But I wouldn't say that the EP and the producers are, you know, I think they're pretty equal. I think it's just a matter of like they're they're just different. I feel like as a producer, you know, you're you're much more hands on with the creative process as well. There definitely are a lot of financiers that I've worked with that are very into the creative and they want to talk about script and they want to give notes. And I I totally am open. I open the door to that because I love that uh, collaboration and that that you know experience with them. But you know, producers have to do pretty much everything for a production mm-hmm. you know, in terms of like like the development all the way through to post and overseeing distribution and you know signing up for cameras that people don't really you know no, normally don't do. <laughs> and so it's uh it's it's a whole process, and I think that an executive producer is someone who can be kind of like um, pretty removed if they want to be. They can be as, as part of the, a bigger part of the production that they, they want to, but they're they're usually more removed. You know, they'll come mm-hmm. to set for a few days, but a producer's there handling everything from day one, so. Yeah, no, that's, I completely agree. That's more what I was getting at when I said the uh, 
producer title is somewhat low sorry the executive producer title is somewhat lower just more less involved um yeah. an analogy i've drawn yeah uh, an analogy I've drawn in the past is the executive producers are functionally the board and the lead producer, the first listed generally, is uh, loosely the CEO of the project. And um, but that is at least how the parlance I use. There's more variance in this than you'd expect on a lot of things. Um, but the. Uh, but yeah, so. You started as an AD. How did you end up fundraising? Yeah, well, I, did, I started as a PA and worked my way up to to AD. And I think that that's I think that's something also that a lot of uh, a lot of people in the executive positions uh, at studios they don't they don't really do that. They don't start as a PA. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great experience because you can really understand what a crew actually does and and what they go through to make movies. And you can appreciate it more, but um, but in terms of the fundraising thing, it was kind of just one of those situations where I was, as a producer, it's kind of like you're pushed into going to go raise money for your movies. You know, no one's going to come to you and say like, "I'm going to help you with this." I mean, it, it it maybe that happens to some people, but it never happened to me. So it's kind of like if I want to get these movies made, I'm going to have to learn how to go out and raise equity and talk to investors and put together business plans and really just talk that game. And so, I mean, honestly, still to this day, I feel like I, I, I'm i more of a banker than I am a producer at some points because you you have to really like understand the financial world and you have to understand how like finance models work and mm -hmm. how everything can be put together to actually make something cohesive. And that is, a, I think that's a, a, a scary thing for a lot of people. Oh yeah, it's a, uh, before I end, did up in a uh as an executive producer i actually worked in security sales so it was a uh, it's a very good background for being a producer um the i also sold life insurance which there's a reason i don't do that anymore um but the uh and it's funny that you call yourself more of a banker given that your office is literally a former bank yeah columbia bank <laughs> yeah yeah. Um yeah, uh, as we were doing the pre-roll, uh he actually showed me his vault a little bit, which is kind of cool. Um the uh are you actually going to use that for anything or just uh... it's a, it's, a, it's our storage room. I I put some metal racks in there so we have, you know, this this uh this place serves as like an art a community art center. So oh, I rent yeah. out on the weekends and mostly weekends. We we do have some weekday rentals, but mm -hmm. um so we allow artists to come in and do photography shoots and we have a photography studio in one of the rooms and um but yeah so i have two metal racks in there that have all of our lighting gear and all of our mm -hmm. you know uh, overflow of stuff that we need to have here so that makes sense and i'd so imagine it's all turned into a storage room well i mean film equipment is pretty expensive it's a uh i guess it's good for it to be uh protected um, yeah it's not lock it's not a, a lockable it's it's oh. it's uh, it's definitely not uh active vault mm -hmm. so, but it's still cool nonetheless that is true um yeah so you've had at least one film in sundance um mm -hmm. did you just cold submit or did you work an internal network to get there uh, that was definitely relationship based. I think this entire industry is like who you know and mm -hmm. how you make it happen. So our one of my, my producing partner on that film and um, you know his family was was a big financial backing for the film. Mm -hmm. uh, he knew he knew some folks. He knew the programmers because he had another film that was at Sundance, and so it helped. You know, it definitely helped. I mean, we were we were filming well past the submission deadline, so we had to keep at grant, getting extensions, and um, and we got in. Uh, you know, it was, it was it was our goal to get into Sundance, and we did. Um, and then after that, we're like, like, okay, now what? You know, so it was definitely a big learning experience for me. Um, but it opened up a lot of doors to sales companies, distributors who are like, okay, you produce this film, like, you know, yeah, we'll take a meeting with you. Um, so that, that was helpful, but uh, it was definitely a big learning process. 
Yeah. I mean, like speaking from the sales and distribution side, every if you have a top 10 or even a top five film festival, you're going to get extra review at the uh, sales agency 100% of the time. And Sundance is still top of the heap um, in terms of just all festivals, not segmented by whatever genre you're actually going for. But um, yeah, so that was, was that the first film you ever had a hand in financing? Uh, yeah, I didn't finance myself, but I, did, mm-hmm. I went out and used finance before. Yeah. That was okay. a great, yeah. Cool. Um, how did you actually find people to who were willing to do the craziest thing imaginable, which is invest in an independent feature film? Well, I became friends with uh, with the an investor on another film that I was first AD, um, mm-hmm. and we built a relationship. And you know, we, we were like, he he said he wants to work with me. He liked me on set. And so uh, that that helped a lot, you know, it helped uh, open that door. And the lead actor in that movie, um, we were shooting a, uh, a Sasquatch movie up in the up in the woods. And there's no, nothing to do because there was no cell service up there. So it was mm-hmm. like you just became really good friends with everybody you're working with. And so the lead actor in that film showed us a, a student short film that he had done. And I was really impressed with it. And I said, hey, what are your plans on, on making a feature out of this? And he's like, I, I don't have any. And so we so we all kind of just being friends. And then, you know, I, I I got him, you know, we worked through scripts and different iterations. And then I brought it up to the investor and said, hey, like, I would really like to make this movie. I think you'll like it, too. And we all just really enjoyed the script. And it just was really a big friendship type relationship that we were able to make the film successfully happened that's great i mean it's a uh i would definitely say it's successful if it made it into sundance did you end up getting a uh decent distribution deal out of it so we had uh at the time it was wme uh handled Mm -hmm. sales on endeavor content um Mm -hmm. and so we had some pretty good offers for some things here and there um and we ended up doing a, a deal with amazon uh, based off of their their deal, anybody who gets into Sundance at that time was was mm-hmm. getting a, a a decent distribution deal through through Amazon. Um, now that I think that has changed, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, but that was where the learning experience really came into play because the film was, while it was critically acclaimed, you know, like it won an award at Sundance and mm-hmm. people loved it. It it was uh, tough to market because of the uh, it wasn't genre specific and it was mm-hmm. just it was a uh, quite a few different genres that were shoved into the film and that that made it really hard. So you know distributors and sales companies were very honest with us. They're like, we love the movie, we just don't know how to market it. And yeah. so from that out, that's where I I was like, okay, I need to focus on making more films that are genre specific and that fo- that stay in that genre. So it's like. You know, so it was a a big learning experience, but you know the film, you know, got distributed through Amazon, and it was a uh, it was a good experience. We did some a few international plays for the film just because it was a '90s nostalgic type film, so you know it played actually surprisingly well, like in Brazil. So mm-hmm. yeah, can people watch that anywhere? Yeah, yeah, you can watch it on uh, on Amazon. So the film title is As You Are, so it's still still up there. Um, I don't know if it's a, I can get the rent now, but mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a great experience. I think it's a, it's a, a very wonderful film. I think the performances are great. It really taught me a lot about casting as well, because I was, I had a big hand in the casting process. Mm-hmm. Um, and from that experience, I really like the model of always trying, especially for independent films, always trying to find, you know, people that are on the rise, you know, mm-hmm. actors the rise so we had charlie heaton who uh this is before stranger things so charlie heaton we really wanted to be in the movie and you know so we we, we fought hard to get him in the film and he is in mm-hmm. and then um amanda lissenberg before she kind of had her break in a lot of the stuff that she's been doing and she's a wonderful talent and so it was a it was just overall like a really fun experience and it's interesting casting you know younger folks in the films because 
they're not household names by any stretch. And so, you know, it's really you're, you're focusing on a lot of talent, but who all, who all is like on the rise. So, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to do that properly. Um, but if you can pull it off, it, it can really give you a lot of legs. Um, who was your lead in Stranger Things? Uh, he, he was, uh, Charlie Heaton was, was the co-lead. So co -lead. He, okay. Jonathan in, uh, in Stranger Things. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, he's, he's a, he's a tremendous talent. Um, yeah, I always really, I, I always kind of felt like he was undersold in Stranger Things. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's, he auditioned, he actually auditioned for the, uh, the opposite role for the, so we had two characters, Jack and Mark. Mm -hmm. He auditioned for Jack and you know, our director was like, yeah, he's great, but, you know, I just, I'm not, I'm not feeling it as, as much for, for this role. And I was like, I, you know, I just feel like he would be a better Mark. And so he read for Mark and it was just like, whoa, like, we were like, that was such a, a tremendous experience to see an actor just go from one character to the next and just like blow us out of the water. And, you know, he, him and him and the director became really good friends and did a lot of Zooms and, we're reading the script together and it was just it was just a really great experience but it was fun to see that that happened where we we're like let's just see if you can read for this role and, and he just nailed it so that's great i mean uh yeah well i mean it seems like you've got a decent eye for casting because those are two uh roles that did two actors that broke pretty well after yeah yeah um, so good on you for that um do you Do you exclusively seek up and coming about to break or do you try to pepper in some existing names to help marketing down the line? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you have to, you have to really, you have to look at the films. I think it's, it's really hard when you're talking about independent films, you really have to like nail down like what type of budget range you're talking about, you know, because if you're doing ultra low budgets, you're not going to get big name people to be in those unless they're best friends of you or the director or whatever. So it's it's really like focusing on I, what I've learned is the best way to focus on is the ensemble. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely try to see if you can sprinkle in a few like character actors or people that are well known or that are in a ton of stuff like that helps significantly. But my my strategy now is to really engage sales agents before you make a film and use those relationships to 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 just bounce that names off of them and be like. What are your thoughts on these people? Like, what are your thoughts on these? Because I've learned it the hard way where I've gone out and I've packaged films and then you go to sales companies and they're like, yeah, but these names, they're good, but they're not great. Like, you're not going to get the budget that you're seeking for this and unless you do solely private equity. And so it's, uh, so I was like, okay, well, I was doing it a little backwards for a while. Mm -hmm. Now let's like refocus our energy and say like, okay, well, I'm going to engage sales companies first. We get all the script and everything polished and the decks polished and everything ready to go. And then we go and get engage sales companies and see who likes what. And that's where you have to really focus on going to the right sales company that, that mm -hmm. focus on specific genres that you're trying to make that fun for. So. Oh yeah. I mean, one thing I've done on that is, uh, specifically geared the bumper talent that's probably not a term but i think you get what i'm driving at um the recognizable names that are small roles in order to help sell the film get them specifically based on the u.s market knowing that if it works well in the u.s it's probably going to carry in a lot of territories and there are a decent number of U.S. territories that will still pre-sale, basically just enough to get your uh, your names in the film. Like they'll pay the fees for that. You won't get much else. But if the rest of your production is with up and comers and well controlled and a good genre, you can at least come back and break even on the European market. Basically, that's one thing I'm doing right now. Um, but have you? Do you do much directly in international sales or do you just find the right sales agent? Uh, I mean, we have done international sales. Like, you know, that's that's usually where sales agents have, mm -hmm. in, my, in my experience, that's where they, they focus on is like, 
It's mm-hmm. like saying this person does really well internationally. Mm-hmm. Uh, the domestic play is something that I haven't really had much success with for the investors. I guess unless mm-hmm. you're like trying to do like uh, a decent backstop deal or something, but yeah. um, but I mean, I actually would prefer that model rather than the international because I feel like it's it's easier to look at, especially with streaming. Streaming has really made mm-hmm. it interesting with uh, you know the algorithms and the way that they view uh, who is who is a, a star or not. Mm-hmm. You know, because they tend to work with the same type of actors based off algorithms, and then. I feel like they also look at um, social media stats a little bit more than traditional sales and and, and distribution models. I'd say that's, yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's it's interesting with the international markets because I, you know, I've been hitting my head against the wall so many times saying like, like this actor or actress is like doing so much. They're on the rise. Mm -hmm. have millions of subscribers on these social media sites. How can we not get them out there and and it's just the same thing it's like just, that's just the way that the model is mm-hmm. you know and i'm sure it's different for different sales companies but the folks that i've been working with they focus on people who are acting in several different movies and using the leads in those mm-hmm. movies so it's an interesting model but i do feel like in the next 10 15 years i think the model is going to kind of organically change for the better i think i hope so um the The biggest problem with the infrastructure that I see right now is just um, a lack of discovery mechanism and a lack of scaling from zero to one. Um, Once you're at one, it's much easier to get to 10, but getting that first bit and actually getting into the system and making the creation of feature films your your full-time gig is extraordinarily difficult um that's yeah and the, and the model definitely mm-hmm. i mean it sense how it how it focuses on you know typically you know older white men are, are what drive the sales because those are the ones who've been doing it the longest mm-hmm. so it makes it really interesting when you talk about like the international marketplace because uh i mean it it's inherently a very sexist and racist system so that I hope is also something that will change as we're kind of seeing the way that that content is being consumed and being you know uh, being watched by people all over the world. Um, which I think that the, the the thing that I do like about the way that streaming has done it is I think it's broken down a lot of barriers and made a lot of films more accessible for people. Because I'm a huge foreign film fan, so oh, like yeah. now you can watch so much more instead of like having to find like like some weird boutique like film film place around the corner that focuses on those type of movies like you can watch little anything you want which is great yeah i mean i agree with you it comes back down to discovery on that level though um finding like foreign films there are massive back catalogs all over the place that you can find but the problem is finding the ones that are actually going to speak to you and are actually going to you um emotionally translate to you is a lot harder without some degree of a guide and i don't think the algorithmic guides are quite as good as that guy who owns that corner dvd shop who you get yeah. to know but yeah, yeah it's I mean, I do miss those days. I mean, I also used to work for Blockbuster for a little bit, so maybe I'm biased. No, I was I was always a, the, the kid who was going in on the weekends and renting a yeah. ton of movies. Like, yeah, I, I love the I love feeling the, the films and looking at them and reading the back of them who made it. You know, there's definitely a different nostalgic era for sure. Um, yeah. I, and now it's like things are so much more accessible. Um which I think is a good thing, but it's also, you know, it is a bad thing because then some things can get fall through the cracks. A lot of things do, you know. But yeah. I yeah, completely agree. Um going back a little bit though, um you made a film 
you pulled off the impossible of getting it into Sundance, which, um, but then you still didn't get a too meaningful of a distribution deal. The one that you got no longer exists, largely due to the fact that Ted Hope isn't the head of Amazon anymore. I get a lot of filmmakers who talk to me and basically say, the goal is make a film, get into Sundance, cash the checks. Basically. Do you have that happen to you anymore? I, it's not as common as it used to be, but I still do get it at least once a month. Get the... Get the um, filmmakers who come and if you ask them what their distribution plan is, they say, we'll get into Sundance and we'll oh. just cash the checks. Um, the, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a lot more difficult than that. Yeah. Um speaking of somebody who's been on the other end of that, um I guess what are some of the biggest if you made if you had to chalk everything up to one single change you made in your pre Sundance career and post Sundance career, what would that change be? Hmm. I mean, <clears throat> I probably would have focused on studying economics more prior to and understanding, you know, financials and things like that. But I, I'm pretty content with how things have, have organically just happened. You know, I think it, it's it, this industry is incredibly difficult and it's incredibly competitive. Um, Sometimes it's more competitive than it needs to be. And I wish that a lot of producers would be a little bit more, you know, collaborative and supportive to one another. But it's something that I'm I'm happy I've learned a lot as I've gone. And I feel like every day I'm learning new things as I go. So I, I really wouldn't say that I would change too much other than more education. I didn't go to film school. So that was obviously one thing that also was a hindrance for me. Mm -hmm. Um but I think that that also helped me out because I've, I've just been a sponge everywhere that I go, you know? And I think that that's just the best thing you can really do is just mm -hmm. try to like absorb as much information and, and education as you can. Okay. You live in Tacoma, right? Correct. How, um, <laughs> do you work in other markets as well or do you primarily work in Washington? I mean, I don't really work much in Washington. We're trying to get more projects up here. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, we're we're international. You know, we we take we're we're working a lot in Colombia. Um, we're bringing projects down there. Our last film that we just uh, sold to Shutter was filmed entirely in Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's. I think that it's unless you're in like a really really strong marketplace for films, like if you're in Georgia or. Some of these other states that are just so competitive with their tax incentives and their infrastructure, you know, it makes sense to make everything there because you're home. Mm -hmm. Washington is growing. The incentives are getting a lot better and more competitive, mm -hmm. uh, but the infrastructure is what we're we're lacking right now. So it's really it's a nerve wracking thing to bring productions up here, not knowing if the top tier crew is going to be available for you. That makes it the hard part. That makes total sense to me and um i shot last year i shot a film in uh uh spokane uh called tim travers and the time traveler's paradox and it's a uh i found the washington crews to be fantastic frankly but i also can understand why most of what's shot around there is only television and there's only really ever one big show at a time so if you're not that one big show you are not going to be able to get the crew you really need to pull off the film that you're making and it's a um i only have that one film experience so i could be wrong go ahead and flame at me in the comments if you must um but the I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly the thing. It's like, yeah. you know, we shot we shot As You Are up in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, a line on a great crew. And then a bigger movie came to town and was shooting, you know, not too far from where we were filming. And mm -hmm. our entire crew just jumped and went over there. You know, it's because independent films, like, you obviously are not going to be paying, like, commercial rates. It's tough. It's mm -hmm. impossible 
people to do that when you're filming a, you know, uh, an under $1 million movie. Um, but, you know, so that's the fear that you have with going to places. When you go to places like Georgia, you know, there's a huge infrastructure down there. So you know mm -hmm. that you'd be, there's enough crew to be able to handle five, six, seven, you know, $200 million movies at a time. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, that's where you have to really focus. We're trying really hard to get more infrastructure up here and trying to do more crew training. It's really the below the line crew is where you really have to focus on, you know, a lot of grip and electrics and, and some of the technical positions with like the sound and like there's, there are a lot of people that do that stuff, but mostly the marketplace up here is, is uh, a lot of commercials. So, yeah, I mean, it does seem like film is film production is decentralizing a lot more than it was like when I went to film school. Um, the game then was basically moved to L.A. or New York, maybe if you're lucky, New Mexico, but you better be really good if you're in New Mexico, because uh, there's just not that much going. There's not as much going through as you think there is. Um, I hear that's changing now. Um no, it absolutely is. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the wonderful thing about these incentives. I mean, not only are the incentives a huge part of our finance models and mm -hmm. they're big perks for investors, you know, because it's like either they get uh, an IRR, you know, right before the film even gets done mm -hmm. or they get uh, to put that money back into like marketing costs or through like deferrals or post-production or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, but it, you're exactly right. It has made it so that you don't have to live in a certain uh, place to make film and TV. It's really made it, you can like, because I can do all my development up here um, and then we just find the places we're going to film. Of course, I would love to be filming up here more and we're, we're working on a few mm -hmm. projects that we're putting together that we will film up here, but it's uh, it's it's only going to grow more and more. But I think once, once, the, once people, the local, you know, population that don't really understand what film production does once they see the the revenue boost that it brings and the the you know it just boosts the economy so much locally mm -hmm. uh, i think people will be a little bit more like excited about supporting things like that so yeah i mean film incentives don't just benefit the film industry they benefit travel um they benefit local food and hospitality massively mm -hmm. um and it's not just about spending on the arts. It's also just really raising the profile of the area you're shooting and helping a lot of small businesses along the way. It's not a uh, bad thing, really. Um, but it's really like you, you really want to focus on the local job growth yeah. because, mm -hmm. you know, as a producer, I would not want to go someplace to go film just based off of tax incentives and fly my entire crew. And that doesn't make any sense. So I would love to hire as much local as I mm -hmm. can because you save money on it. You know, you don't have to put up a bunch of people. You don't have to pay per diem for a bunch of people because they're local. Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot more sense. And so that's where it's like, if a lot of these places that are focusing on the uh, tax incentives, they also focus on the infrastructure, you know, the, the field of dreams, um, you know, motto doesn't really work with, with this. If you, if you build it, they will come. You need to also build up <laughs> infrastructure too. You can't just have the incentives. So. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest things about these incentives and the ones that have worked versus the ones that haven't is that this is not an overnight thing. It takes the better part of a decade, at least to really, build the infrastructure you need to build a strong film community the other thing is if you were if we're talking about union productions which aren't what come at first real always but over time they do tend to come more and more those are better paid than the vast majority of local jobs they're like i mean not many jobs in the area pay anywhere between seven hundred and twelve hundred dollars a day that's yeah. just not a thing um and i think that is one big thing that i have some friends who were on an early episode of the podcast um who are really trying to build an incubator in new mexico and a lot of that is just trying to reorient the existing new mexico incentives to be more 
building from the bottom up as opposed to attracting the big productions in. And I think that is a really interesting thing to talk about when it comes to incentives. But oh yeah. Yeah. I think I think you know like Washington is not a it's not a right to work state. So mm -hmm. you have to work with unions up here. Mm -hmm. And when you're when you're training people to do union union labor, I mean yeah. I mean the commercial rates up here are higher than in LA. Mm -hmm. So you pay your keys like eight fifty, nine hundred bucks a day, you mm -hmm. know, like it's 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 pretty it's pretty good pay when you think about it. Like at, at the end of it, if you're doing like, you know, 30, 40 day movies or shows or whatever, like that's that's a good good living, you know. So it's mm -hmm. like if you create that infrastructure properly and you build it out to where it makes sense. I mean, you know, up here in Washington, if you film in 30 of the 39 counties that are considered rural in Washington, mm -hmm. they now have a 40% bump. So a 40% incentive. So it's like that's a pretty good reason to to bring some stuff up here. And they also now support commercials in Washington, which is fantastic. So yeah. so it's a it's yeah, it's just it's about you know going hand in hand with the infrastructure and the incentives and and having also like good communication with the local mm -hmm. you know governments and and the people to to make it happen and make it an easy process for people to make productions yeah so how much of your film do you generally try to get financed in ways that are not equity i mean Traditionally speaking, the the majority of my films have been uh, all private equity mm -hmm. and a little bit of debt with the tax incentives. Mm -hmm. um, but now the models that we're building out, because now we're looking at giving like 15, 20 million dollar movies. Mm -hmm. Now that obviously has changed drastically. So, you know, we're looking more like that 20 to 30 percent of private equity and the rest is going to be all debt. Okay, and I assume, I assume debt backed on uh back debt with either pre-sales or tax incentives, right? Right. Yeah. Um. For those listening, um, I have blogs and videos on it, but uh, you never want to take unbacked, unsecured debt. Um, if you can borrow against something like a tax incentive or a pre-sale from a reputable company that's that's a great way of financing um that's possibly the best you can find realistically but the um for large money but uh yeah and when we say equity we just mean from investors um i'll link some of those in the in the uh description you've dealt with a decent number of sales agents um how have you done your diligence on them how have you looked into them yeah i mean that's always hard i mean we've, we've had some some good relationships with folks and we've had some bad ones i mean i really really like to focus on uh boutique sales companies i feel mm -hmm. like they're the ones that are going to be the champions for your films uh, because they also only have so much bandwidth to take on so many projects. So if they take on your project, it's a meaningful relationship right there. Yeah, I feel like some of the bigger uh, sales companies, you kind of get lost in the shuffle. And if things aren't really going as planned, it's kind of like you get kind of put on the back burner a little bit. So we, so I really try to build relationships with people. Mm -hmm. Um so like, like, you know, I'm working a lot with some sales reps right now, and it was a matter of um, meeting with these folks for years before I was like, okay, let's make a movie together. Like anytime I go to LA, it's like, let's go grab dinner. Let's go, mm -hmm. let's go become friends and kind of understand each other. So that was, that's a process. I think, you know, I think in this industry, you really have to take relationships just so seriously. It's almost like you're, you're dating people. Like, you have to take it so seriously, like investors. I want to make sure that we get the right investors for the project. And we're not just working with like crummy people who are going to take advantage of you or that are going to be upset if they're not making, you know, 150% back on their film, which is very hard to do. So it's, uh, it's, it's just, 
so with the sales reps, it's kind of just the same like model mm -hmm. for me, building relationships and seeing, you look at people's filmography, like what have they done? Is it similar to the film that you you're, you want them to, to rep? Um, if they did like a film that you really enjoy, like, like talk to them about that, you know, like the company that did our sales rep for, he was our sales rep for, uh, for Quicksand, they've done so many films, you know, Altitude. So they've done so many great films and like, and they've repped uh, a lot of films that have gone on to win Academy Awards. And so mm -hmm. I liked their, their approach to things because they were taking on these prestige dramas, but they're also taking on like, you know, these low budget indie horror films. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. It was kind of fun to kind of see that they're, they're they just like that. They like to be a part of films. And so it's, it's, uh, I'm definitely rambling on it, but that's just kind of like the experience that I, I go into it with. Yeah. I mean, relationships in this business are absolutely vital. I mean, relationships in any business are important, but in the film industry, it's really unlike uh other industries i've seen and worked in you always do kind of need to know somebody and trust somebody and also talking to an investor is always a bit like dating that's just true i've actually had some investors say i mean yeah it was a second date after a meeting with an entrepreneur directly um but the uh it's It is something that I think takes a while to accept, even if you've been told it, even if because film school will tell you this, hopefully, but it takes a while for people to actually accept exactly how deep this runs. And sometimes I still have to remind myself of exactly how deep these relationship wells run, basically. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, what are you working on next? That's always so hard to answer because it's kind of like, you know, as an independent producer, I feel like I just have a ton of coals in the fire. Mm -hmm. And you never know which one's actually going to strike hot and you just mm -hmm. run with that one. Mm -hmm. um, we have a pretty big uh, television series. Um, I, I I created a, a, a new finance model that uh, for TV that allows mm -hmm. private equity to be a part of uh, the television process, which is something that has not really been too successful in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's something that um, we're very, very excited about. I can't really go too deep into the relationships that we have, but it's with some of the biggest people in the industry who are helping us make this thing. And uh, it's gonna be a very big show. So we're very excited about that. So we have that, we have a, so I, yeah, during the pandemic, I was like consuming so much TV mm -hmm. that I was why am I not producing TV? I love TV, I love watching, you know, these, these. Uh, that's also where I think that the streaming world has made it so these, these TV shows are now like, you know, cinematic masterpieces. So. I love I love that that world and so we now have three TV shows that we're producing. Obviously, we have kept them under wraps now, especially with all the strikes and that new stuff happening. We're kind mm -hmm. of on pause, but uh, but we have that and we have several features that we're also you know pushing forward. Um, but right now, I'm focusing my energy towards uh, investor outreach and building those relationships um, while we're kind of like navigating these strikes. That makes sense. I mean, the strikes will end eventually. Yeah. It's a... Um... And I think that they will end, and I think that they will actually prove uh, once again that independent film is going to be... I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to boost independent filmmaking like significantly. You know, when you have people who are talking about, you know, independent film the way that they're as, as passionately as like Mark Ruffalo, like... Mm -hmm. uh, that is like, it's exciting to me that, that this is where we're kind of going, you know, and that is the best way to show the studios, you know, we're going to go make our own stuff, 
And if you want to be a part of it, great. Then let's. Mm-hmm. So I think I think independent film is gonna is gonna really skyrocket after these strikes. I hope you're right. I mean, right now it's been a uh, for a while it's been a little bit of a bleak time for indie film. Um, especially yeah, I think, I think the pandemic did not do anybody any service, but like the theaters just collapsing based off of the fact that now it seems like to me like mostly it's tentpole productions that are doing well at the theaters. I would love to see more independent films dominating the box office, but you know that would be great to see if that happen out of this uh, this whole craziness. But you know that's also where the consumption of uh, of uh, content is is changing uh, the playing field too. The biggest I actually quite like streaming. I also like physical media. A lot of times when I'm buying physical media, I specifically look for the ones with the digital copy. Because I like having the disc. I like being able to hold it. I like being able to look at it. But I also like being able to point my remote at my TV and watch what I want to watch. Um, And that's the good intermediary for me. But it has definitely upended the independent film and just film in general uh, revenue model. And it's... I think it's been a little surprising, especially in the last, like, year and a half or so um transactional sales have been really down overall especially for independent film but it's really hard to get people to actually click the buy button and spend money on a film when there's just so much content available for free yeah um yeah, I agree. I think that's 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 definitely, and I feel like that as a consumer too. You know, when I'm like, I go and I'll find like a foreign film that I really want to watch, and I will rent it, and or a filmmaker that I'm really following, and and I want to support them, I will rent them. But you're you're absolutely right. When you like, should I rent this or should I go watch something else that's free? Because I'm already paying, you know, however much money for all these subscriptions I have. So it's it's definitely uh, a dichotomy for sure. Mm-hmm. yeah it's i mean i've seen it worse for documentaries than narr- than uh traditional feature films narrative feature films um i think that has a lot to do with like how nobody pays for news anymore and that's kind of you know destroying our society in a way but um the and I think that there's some of that same mindset for documentaries now. But in general, unless it's something like the next big Tom Cruise movie, wh- uh, how do you convince people as a producer to actually watch your work? Well, you know, that that's where it's really hard because even when you get a film that gets us even a decent streaming uh mm-hmm. You know, like that's where I've always told filmmakers too. like your initial sale of your film is where you're going to make most of your money. Mm-hmm. If, if that's not all you, that's probably going to be all your money. You know, like you sell to Apple or Netflix or these things. That's it. You know, that's all you're going to make off of that film. Mm-hmm. Well, you got to, you know, go out with a bang with that. So and hopefully get a good international deal. But yeah, they, they, the streamers also don't, they don't put money into marketing for your film because they're marketing their big, blockbusters and their tent poles so that's where it's making it really interesting and we're we're trying to develop our own internal marketing plans that are going to be helpful for releasing films um you know and that that's where it comes down to budgeting properly for that stuff um working with investors to say like hey we would like to take you know fifty thousand from this tax incentive and put it towards the marketing campaign that will be effective so it's 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 really just being strategic about the way that you're presenting your films and understanding social media, which is something that I am personally awful at. But yeah, what, I'm not great my either. My wife is really good at social media, so <laughs> she handles all of our marketing stuff for the company. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, it's it's a it's just figuring out a way to strategize that stuff. And I think working with sales reps and and distributors on how you can effectively make that happen. You know, mm-hmm. we're trying to come up with, I'm trying to come up with new finance models that will 
incorporate some uh, some of your own P and A that you bring to the table through private equity, um, because that is the best way to get your film seen is through mm -hmm. marketing. You know, it's still it's still the same thing. You know, fortunately, marketing isn't as expensive. I don't think with social media, I think you can get away with a lot for a lot less. But that's that's less true than it used to be. Um, the uh... In fact, it's so far less true that depending on what exactly your desired outcome from the marketing is, like if you're primarily building awareness of the film, uh, you can actually get a significantly better cost per impression through traditional and often ignored uh, meat advertising sources like radio ads. If you're doing a very targeted radio ads to cities where you're actually renting screens or um, showing screens can actually be really effective at drawing at putting butts in seats for those markets specifically. Yeah. It doesn't make sense on a national level at all, but, uh, uh, or as the entirety of your strategy, you kind of have to look at radio. You have to look at like six different ways to market, which is why they're, it, it, it gets overwhelming as an independent filmmaker really fast. It gets overwhelming as a distributor really fast. And it's just, I mean, there isn't a super solid solution for, uh, that is at scale for this, it, definitely not on an industry-wide level, not even really on an independent level. You just kind of have to figure out what works and continue to keep doing that. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think every film has a different, um, you know, has yeah. a different football. Um, you know, it's like, you know, you're doing like a, a horror film. It's like, you obviously have a different strategy if you're doing a prestige <laughs> drama. You know, it's it's just a different strategy, but it's like how you can yeah, how you can effectively target the the right people for the for the production. Get it get it out to the right websites for reviews and things like that like mm -hmm. but yeah it's uh marketing is definitely not my forte um mm -hmm. and i think as a producer i think that you really can't focus on marketing because you know you're on to your next project or you're already doing your next project and it's like so we have this film that's on shutter right now and it's like you know i've only made a few social media posts and like because I have to be, I'm working crazy hours to get these other projects going. So, you know, having the budget to be able to pay for for those things is is great because then you can have great companies, you know, do it. Because there's so many great PR companies out there. You know? Oh yeah, no, I mean it's a it's it's a skill in an in and of itself. Um, I. It's just unfortunate that so many independent creators find themselves in the business of less making films and more monetizing their own work from two years ago. It's a, uh, but uh, it's either that or I don't know, work in insurance and nobody wants to do that. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's definitely difficult to, uh, because mm -hmm. making a film is, is quite possibly one of the hardest things you can do. Mm -hmm. It's so hard from start to finish to be able to get something done and out there that's decent enough to get a distribution deal and get uh, get on a platform. It's yeah. it's incredibly hard, and you never know what's what's going to come of it. You never know if the director you hired is not going to do their job, or the film is going to suck when you're when you're watching it in the roughs and you're like, okay, we got to figure out uh, an exit strategy here. Like it's it's a scary it's a scary process mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, it's a it's a incredibly risky very skilled underpaid and incredibly scary place to be as a producer so yeah. it's just a so if you don't absolutely love movies and love the craft don't do it exactly. I, I, yeah um but if you do you have to kind of grit it out and find what you can to make it work so to close out i always ask my guests the same three questions um i ask you can answer the first one second 
because sometimes it takes a second to think about it. Um, just tell me to ask the second one and I will. Um, and the third one you should know off the top of your head. Um, so the first question is, what are your top three favorite movies of all time as it stands right this second now? They can change in 10 minutes and be an entirely different three. But just what are you vibing on as we're sitting here talking? And I really hope one's a bank heist movie. <laughs> uh man. That's a that's a tough question. Um, as a consumer, I am uh into darker films. Um a big film of mine that I, I just I, I loved um so much and I've I've watched several times is uh is Bullhead. Um I'm a big fan of that film and it, it, it definitely was a moving piece of, of work. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a very big uh, Nicholas Women Reference fan as well. And so I think the Pusher films, I, I'm going to just put them all together as one because they mm -hmm. kind of play that way. I love that trilogy. Um, and then Jeans. There's so this this is a tough question because there's so much good there's so much good cinema out there. It's so hard to narrow down. I mean, I have very high hopes for Oppenheimer. I'm gonna go see that soon. Um Are you doing the Barbenheimer feature or just Oppenheimer? I mean, I'll definitely the thing is with kids, it's like mm. leave that time away to go to two different movies is is tough. Um, and that's a third one that, that's there's just so many good movies out there um i'll have to think on that i'll have to think okay um okay. question the second question is if i mean and i kind of teased it earlier on accident um if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice um what would that advice be and when would you give it to yourself? I mean, I, I think it's the same, similar answer. Mm -hmm. It's just more education, more understanding of how economics work. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's advice that I give to a lot of, of uh, mm -hmm. film students or people trying to get into this industry is like, learn a specific skill that is needed in this industry. Mm -hmm. you know, my skill set that I really focused on and learned was scheduling films. And mm -hmm. so I do that all the time and I schedule my own movies, but mm -hmm. I, it's like, that's a skill set that I have that is something that I focus on. But I always tell uh, future students to always focus on like economics. And I think mm -hmm. that if I could have gone back in time, I probably would have done some sort of a business degree or an economics degree um but uh to go in hand in hand with the you know film degree mm -hmm. but, yeah. that makes sense and then the on um, did you think of a third movie this is like always hard for me like i'm one of those people that like needs to reflect a lot more on, on mm -hmm. things like that because like like when I play like like those categories games and things like that with people, yeah, I'm somebody who needs to like sit and think about things a lot more. I can't be on the on the cusp. Let me, I'll, I'll look at I'll look up something. Um, I mean, I've not thought of anything yet. It, it is all right. Um, the uh. So then the last question is, uh, where can people find you and what are you looking for? People can find me on, uh, I mean, on IMDb, I have mm -hmm. my, uh, I mean, probably pro for most people. I have my, all my contact information there. Uh, our website is uh, 222pictures.com. They can find us there. They can find, you know, me there. Um, and then on social media, you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Um, I think for me, it's like I always try, and this is something that, like, for 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 your viewers to like know, mm -hmm. like, I think 
what I, I talked a little bit about it, how I feel like in this industry, producers tend to shield themselves off and not be as accessible as I think that we all should be to one another, for each other. So my thing that I like to try to support people with is when they are about to approach investors, um, I'll do a conversation with them just to talk them through that process and figure out how we can effectively get them what they need, but mm -hmm. also thinking of the investors, you know, you know that, that relationship is key. Mm -hmm. So it's always something if people reach out to me and they say, hey, Sean, I'm going to be meeting with this investor. I'd love to go over some things with you. You know, it's not a thing for me to like know who their investors are. It's more so like, what are the documents that you're presenting? What are you promising these people? Because mm -hmm. if you burn that bridge with that investor, it's going to burn more bridges for other people down the road. And it's going to spread like a wildfire because that investor is going to go tell all their investor friends, don't invest in film. So it's something that I always like to have an open door policy with is like, if people reach out to me, I'm happy to just do a, a quick Zoom with them. What do you have that you want to present to these people? What are you trying to get out of that? And what are you promising these people? Because, you know, you should never promise too much when it comes to film finance. So um, that is something that just to throw out there to people mm -hmm. is something I really do take seriously because um, I have had so many conversations with investors where they're like, yeah, I invested in a film 10 years ago and I'm never going to do it again. Yeah, that experience because I didn't make my money back, or you know, I felt cheated. You know, and that that's it's it's a tough thing, but it's it's something that I think that as independent producers, we all really, you really need to be very careful with how you approach the certain situations. Yeah, no, you're totally right. I mean, in reality, to some degree, the most you can promise any investor is that you will try your damnedest to not lose every cent of their money. It's sadly kind of where it is, um, but the uh, you should be able to do better than that. And, but in the end, the the legal paperwork is not going to be that far removed from that. It's um not a lawyer. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But the uh, so not a lawyer, not legal advice. Um, now I got to put that hashtag on here. Great. Um, the, uh, anyway, Sean, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I will put your links in the bio, um, and thank you all for listening, watching. Um, if you're watching, uh, please like subscribe, uh, click auto download. Uh, if you're on Spotify, hit the bell if you're on YouTube, and check out my free independent film resource guide, which includes a or resource package, excuse me, which is at thegorillarep.com slash resources. And it even includes a free indie film fundraising tech um, uh, deck template. So it is a uh, nice little thing for you there. See you guys next week.